Well, we just got in a big box here. We've got the 2025 20, Vintage from Yamaha, and it's going to be replacing my RX series in here. And this is a six. Well, we just got in a big old box. This is the Avantage 2085 receiver, and it is going to be replacing my 683. This is a very nice 7.2, but it doesn't have pre-outs, and it's got the mid-tier DAC in it. This has a single Burr Brown. This steps up to a dual Saber, an ESS Saber DAC system. Steps up from 85 watts to 140 per channel, and it's a 9.2, which gives me an extra two channels to install either two more surrounds or what I'm gonna do, two more Atmos speakers. So my speakers have been broken in for quite some time now. I have a awesome playlist that has my favorite songs in that I just sit here and enjoy in two channel stereo. I'm very familiar with a lot of different songs. I also have test tracks specifically for setting up speakers, setting up the system. I know exactly how things sound on this setup. So what I'm going to do is swap it in and do all kinds of testing. I'm gonna set up the room exactly the same way I don't use any DSP, I don't use any EQ. It's a very simple setup. I use the room correction just to set my image and I adjust bass levels to taste. It's nothing unusual. I set it so movies sound like I'm in a really good IMAX and two channel music is totally natural. It's not muddy, it's not booming, there's no localization. Everything mixes like you're there live in front of the band. That's what I like. So I'm not a super bass head. I don't need four subs slamming me from every direction and just, you know, triple what is a flat bass curve. I mean, that's totally cool. Totally understand the people that love that, but I like it just the way it's mixed. That's just me. So I'm not going to be doing any of these YouTube sound demos because even when you hear a difference, it's not indicative of what you're actually hearing way too many variables, plus it gets flagged for copyright. So I'm gonna give you my subjective opinions of all the differences. I'm gonna be looking for several different things. One, how is the sound stage? I do expect, going from that series to the upper series, I do expect everything to be improved. I expect cleaner sound overall, especially because it has the better decks. I expect a better sound stage right now, the sound stage is very good. I have a locked in center image. I have great left to right placement. It actually extends beyond the speakers depending on the track, but I don't have that much depth. It pushes generally depending on the track, it pushes the sound stage slightly behind the speakers like it's inside the fireplace. I really don't hear anything coming forward and I certainly don't have anything using any kind of height. And yes, some songs with a really good sound setup, I've heard, not here, but other uh, stores and demo centers, I have heard some height come out of a great setup soundstage. So I don't know if I'll get that, but I do expect some better depth and some better clarity. I want it to sound like I'm sitting front row somewhere. I don't know overall how the sound is going to be different, if the bass is gonna be punchier, if the high end is gonna be smoother, we'll just have to see. But I'm gonna play a whole bunch of music. I'm gonna sit here and listen for a couple hours after I get everything hooked up, re-set up the room correction. I'll also note differences than that because that's also a step up. The current unit, the 683, has the mid-tier YPOW system. The basic one just sets up for one position in one seat and that's it. All it does is set up your levels and delays and phase. This one takes into consideration secondary room reflections. So it can calculate if sound is bouncing off walls, ceiling, and floor and compensate for that in the signal. 
and it actually does make a really good difference, especially in this room. Before I had those put in, it was extremely echoey, and I went from a standard 5.1 with the basic YPOW to this one, and it did make an immediate difference. This one steps it up even further, and you get multi-point measurements and multi-height measurements. So I do expect to have some better flexibility on where I sit. Right now, my sweet spot, if I sit in that seat, which right here, that's what I've got the room set up to be the perfect chair. And no, it's not in the center of the speakers, but after room correction, it puts the image directly center. That's the cool thing about it. But with the multi-point, I expect to have more seating options. So maybe this seat will be better at least than the other one because if i switch right now and i go to this second seat it totally messes with the sound stage and the image so we'll see what happens but i got a lot of testing to do i've got a lot of setup to do because this thing is huge and heavy compared to my old one i have to completely redo the rack this receiver is going to have to go on the bottom because that's a glass shelf and this thing is like 50 pounds glass shelf does not support 50 pounds so everything is coming out this is a multi-hour project everything gets rewired not looking forward to it but it's got to be done so let's take a quick run through here of what was in the box this is everything with a couple of the old accessories and once i get that out i'll put them side by side just so you can see uh first impression if you are coming from an older uh, 5.1 or a base model recent unit, this is going to be absolutely mammoth sized. If you're coming from a current mid unit, it's not that different. It really isn't. A little bit taller. I don't think it's any wider. I think it's maybe an inch deeper. So pretty darn similar. That one was already too big for the cabinet and I had to cut out the back board in the actual cabinet just to fit it in there because my HDMI cables you know extend out that far before they can make a bend and it didn't fit so I'll have to make another cut on the bottom for this for sure but overall pretty darn similar it's simpler because you've got this big metal plate whereas the non vintage series still have some buttons on the front like that guy over there this is all hidden not that it really matters to most people because most people are going to be putting them in a cabinet so i got mine behind that black panel i don't really care and the only time i ever use the front panel is for plugging in the calibration uh, microphone or does this even have a front hdmi wow it doesn't oh that sucks Okay, well, uh, I'll probably have to run a little dongle or an extension or something because when I tune with REW, which admittedly isn't that frequently, but I do want to do it again, of course, with this system, and I haven't done it yet since I got in the new seating, that was really convenient for plugging into the laptop. So that kind of sucks that they took that away. All we have is a USB, and that's probably just for power, the microphone and headphones and an aux audio RCA in. Bummer, why did they do that? And the only buttons when this is closed is power. That's kind of different. I, I thought it would click. How does that? Oh, you push the bottom. It's a soft open. It's kind of a, it feels magnetic. It might be magnetic. It might just be like a little cantilever. That's a nice, nice feeling door. I like that. Uh, we've got a peer direct button, which cancels all DSP, all EQing. It simply sends the signal directly from whatever input into the amplifier circuits out the speakers. That's it. So it's the cleanest possible, well, also through the DACs, but it's the cleanest possible sound just using the amplification and DAC circuits and not going through anything else. It's not gonna sound very good unless you have your room physically set up for the perfect image and you are sitting in the perfect centered spot. Anything else, pure direct, is pure garbage. <laughs> so if you're like me and you've set up your seating position slightly off center, which many people are gonna have 
for movies because unless you're sitting in the middle of your couch, which isn't the ideal seat, you know, that's not going to be your right position. So I never use Pure Direct, just the way it is. And you also need really the best, I mean, full range main speakers as possible because it doesn't use a sub. It just pipes out, if you're listening to stereo, two channels. That's it. That's all you get. So you're going to hear every limitation of your main speakers. If they only go down to 40 hertz or 45 hertz, that's all you're ever going to hear because the sub will never come on with Pure Direct. So that's what that does. And then you got your main power switch. You've got your input, which is a metal, almost knurled. It, it's got a really, really fine knurling on it. It's a nice little texture and it has very soft detents, but it feels like an electronic knob. It's not clicky. Does that move? No, that's just a trim ring. And then a bigger volume knob. Now this one feels great. This is nice and smooth. It's got some weight and resistance to it. You can't spin it, but extremely easy to make fine adjustments. I like the way they did that. Not that I'll ever be touching it because I do everything through remotes. Speaking of remotes, awesome, awesome remote. This is a new one. This is the old one. And this is still current for all the mid-range models. It's a great remote. Feels good in the hand. Normal rubberized soft touch buttons. You know, nothing unusual. It's got buttons for everything, dedicated, and it works great. Feels good in the hand. No complaints about it, but it's nothing special. This guy, oh, heavy. Three times as heavy, made of metal, backlit. All you have to do is just touch the surface. You can't see it now, but it's slightly glowing. Really feels good in the hand. The buttons are, well, first of all, the whole surface is rubber. It's a rubberized. Uh, dome switch type feel and man this thing feels nice I mean this is some good quality unfortunately I'll never use it because I use my harmony system for everything but if you need to use your remote know that these come with a very nice remote great job there now this is the new calibration mic it's a little triangle shape and this is the micro, uh, the calibration microphone stand. So if you're just using it like the old systems, this is the old mic here, you just place it in the one position and you take your measurement and you're done. But this upper receiver has the ability to do multi-point. So you do these three and then you put it up here tall and you get multiple points and that's how it really tunes the room for your seating position. This one, you just put it where the middle of your head is in the room, and that's it. It'll do very well correcting for the room reflections, but you get one spot, that's it, you're done. So I do expect a difference there. You get a power cord, nothing special whatsoever. Now I am not one to simply blow off that power cords make a difference. There are, if you're unfamiliar, there are power cords. This right here, just a regular, power cord that cost thousands of dollars, $10,000 for a power cord. I'm not kidding. And there are people that swear it makes a difference. I have never tested it. I have never heard anything in person to tell you. I've seen a couple very rare AB tests on YouTube. Yes, I can actually hear a slight difference. I can tell when they switch that there is a change. And by the way, it's using good headphones that I can do that on. Is it worth even a hundred dollars to me? Hell no. It is a tiny, tiny difference, but that's through YouTube. I have no idea what it actually sounds like in person. Okay. Not a clue. So uh, my gut feeling is uh, there's some other reason that the sound sounds different because look, your power is going through the power company through transmission lines into your breaker panel through regular old Romex through the wall into a regular $3 outlet, then into the power cord. And then the wires in your receiver are nothing special. They're little 14 gauge, you know, stranded copper wires. 
why replacing this one little tiny section of that chain makes any difference? Uh, you know, my gut says no, it, it doesn't. But I've never heard it in person. I also thought that the rubber isolation feet on the bottom of a sub was bullshit. And they said, oh, it'll greatly reduce room vibration. It'll stop things on the wall from vibrating, like that stuff there. I thought, that's bullshit. But I had, I can't remember if it was a sale or a coupon, got a set. Holy crap, it works. I mean, day and night different. It stopped things in the wall vibrating. It stopped all of that vibrating. It stopped my dishes in the cabinets vibrating. And I did nothing but screw on rubber feet. It works. So I'm not going to tell you that a power cord doesn't make a difference because I've never heard it. But my gut feeling is still bullshit. <laughs> you get an AM and FM antenna, which I don't know anybody that uses those. I literally have a collection of these from upgrading over the years and they just never get unwrapped. And I always forget to give them with the receivers when I sell them. And yeah, I've had a lot of them. I don't know, this is like my seventh or eighth one, not including separates. This actually reminds me a lot of one of my favorites. It was an old Class A Kenwood back in the 90s. And it was even heavier than this, because if you know what Class A is, heavy. I mean, really freaking heavy. It was a, one of the first Class A 5.1s that came out, and holy moly, that thing weighed a ton. But very similar look very similar weight, good construction. Now this 2085 is internally 100% identical to the 2080, which is a second from the top of the line. The 3080 is the top of the line. The difference between the 85 and 80 is about a thousand dollars. Number one, number two, this has a two year warranty. The 2080 has a three year warranty and this is missing a third foot in the middle. This has four in the corners. The 2080 has one in the middle. And that's for long term, I mean long term, like 10 plus years durability. It helps support all the circuit boards and the chassis right in the middle from long term flex. I mean long term. I don't keep things that long. I don't give a crap. Two year warranty? Great. Normal ones only come with one. I've never, knock on wood, had a warranty problem with anything Yamaha. So I'm not worried about it. I saved the money. Awesome deal to me. So that's that. Let's spin around and look at the back, which is huge. So right away, similar but slightly upgraded speaker connections here. These are like a, a clear knurled plastic and the other one, the 683, is just a uh, solid red plastic, but really about the same. Uh, there's no metal bits other than the inserts here for the banana plugs. Still a complete pain in the ass to wire in. You have to unscrew these all the way, put the wires down at an angle and screw them in tight. Big difference here, we now have pre-outs. So we can connect outboard external amplifiers to our main speakers. And that is a big plus uh, maybe down the road, I don't know if I plan to do it, but yeah, who knows? Maybe I get some huge, really inefficient speakers that I need to pump power to. Maybe I get some magna planers, which I absolutely love the sound of. And, you know, maybe I, I put this in a separate room just for two channel audio and I want to get a nice 200, 250 watt amp. I can do it here. Couldn't do that with the 683. You didn't have any of these pre-outs. All you had were the internal amplification and that's it. Trigger out, remote out, seven different HDMI inputs. I don't know if they're all the same. It says it's uh, 2.2 for all of them. I don't know what the bandwidth limitation is. You have two HDMI outputs, one with audio return channel. So use that one for your home theater. And down here, we have a separate one for zone three. This one also adds three zones as opposed to two for the other one. So if you're using this in a multi-room configuration, say you want your home theater and you want your lanai wired and maybe your den or the kids room or whatever, you wanna run a separate TV out to the kids room, this can do it right there. If you want the lanai just to get music, you can do it. Great, you can do whatever you want. 
you've got lots of digital inputs and lots of analog inputs, pretty much anything you want here. So pretty standard back, no balanced inputs or outputs, no XLR connections. Um, Yamaha pretty much draws a line to that. I don't know if the 3080 has that or not. I don't believe it does. As far as I know, that just bumps up the DAX one more step and adds a little bit more power. You're, you're coming close to the 15 amp limit with these units as it is, so you can't uh, get too much more out of them because the standard 15 amp breaker to a room is your hard limit. Other than that, you have to run a dedicated, say 20 amp line and plug your receiver or amplification stack into that. So that's it so far, looking good. Now to get that completely out, label everything, and completely reconfigure it. So I want to clarify and correct myself here for a moment. Because I've been calling this an a vintage receiver, technically it's not, but I think in a minute you might forgive me for saying so. So like I said earlier, the guts of this, the the case, the controls, the software, everything is the Avantage 2080 unit. But this is the 2085, and it's technically not an Avantage series. It's an RXV, not an RXA, because it doesn't have that three-year warranty. It just has the two-year warranty. Without that, it cannot be in the Avantage line. But everything in there is a physical a vintage line receiver. Now, I don't have any contacts at Yamaha. Nothing you see has been sponsored or donated or anything. I'm just a regular old consumer Joe. So I can't tell you for sure why they even produce this unit. It, at first glance, doesn't make any sense. Why would they carbon copy something, put a new model num number on it, drop a year off the warranty, and drop a whole bunch of money off of it. Couldn't tell you for sure, but as someone with a lot of retail sales and business experience, I can give you my best guess. See, there are two distinct sales lines for Yamaha receivers. And this is pretty common for a lot of different companies, a lot of different types of products. For example, Toyota and Lexus, same company share some parts, share some manufacturing facilities, but Lexus cars have an upscale engineering and production value in nearly every way. Longer warranty, better components, et cetera, et cetera, and much higher price. But you can't sell Lexus cars if you're a Toyota dealer. You have to be an authorized Lexus dealer. Same with the Avantage and the normal Yamaha receiver lines. You have to be an authorized, certified Avantage dealer to get the Avantage receivers. I believe there are only three of them this year, maybe four. The one, two, three thousand line that I'm aware of. So if you're one of the small number of Avantage receiver lines, you can carry it all. You're probably only carrying the Avantage. You're not bothering with the, the lower-end RXV lines, but you could. For the much larger number of distributors and dealers out there that just have a normal Yamaha line account, they can carry the regular RXVs, but they cannot carry the higher-end stuff because there are no high-end regular receivers. They stop at the mid-level. To get better than that, you have to go to a Vintage until this. So my guess is they were throwing a bone to all the other dealers out there, and there's probably 100 to 1 regular dealers to a vintage dealers, right? They were probably saying, okay, we got to fill a gap because there are a lot of people out there that want to buy a high-end receiver, maybe just one, because this is the only one they do this for. They pick the middle of the line a vintage, the 2000 series, to do it with, we're going to be able to give them, all those regular dealers, an option, finally. So now you can, in any store that sells Yamaha receivers, get this because it's not the Vintage line. That's my best guess. But 
I will probably slip up many times and call this an advantage because in my mind, it's a 2080 advantage. But technically, to be clear, it's not. And it's an RXV regular series 2085. So just want to make that clear. So this should give you a real good size comparison between the mid-grade models and the upper tier models. There is definitely a depth difference. Not so much height, maybe an inch, that's about it, and not any more wide. So it's really about your cabinet depth. Now I'm kind of in a bit of a pickle here because <laughs> I'm gonna have to severely modify my rack here. I love the look of it. This is a very inexpensive, oh God, I can't remember the name of the series. It might be the Malm, M-A-L-M. So it's from Ikea. They're completely customizable. So this is a combination of parts. They have just the wood shell that's called the frame. It's like 40 bucks. And then I added a center glass shelf. And that was like, I don't know, 20 bucks. And it holds, I believe, 30 pounds. And then I added the smoked glass door. And they've got different options for all of this. I put soft close hinges on it. I mean, I was total into this, like 100 bucks and it's exactly like I wanted, and it blends in perfectly. So, you know, really nice unit. Now, my previous receiver was about, again, the same kind of step down. It was uh, shallower, and it came to about here, completely fit in there, no modifications necessary. This one was right to the limit. The depth of the cabinet comes right to the depth of the back here. And the problem was my HDMI cables stuck out about that far, and that was too much. So what I had to do was just cut a little access hole here for them. And that just allowed the HDMI cables to stick out, you know, an inch. And it fit in that way, no problem. Had about a half inch clearance in the front, and all was good. Well, that's not an issue here. <laughs> so now we have to accommodate that. Basically what it means is, I'm going to have to cut most of the bottom section out. Now the problem is, like I said, this is their cheap series. This is the stuff that college kids buy, right? And you know, it doesn't matter if it only lasts a year or two. It was 40 bucks for the frame, who cares? You know, it breaks to throw it out. It's not furniture. The problem is this is one of those where it's designed to only work with this cardboard backing. This is that, you know, flimsy cardboard stuff that just slides in the grooves. It's not hardwood back here. And these top and side pieces are just bolted to each other. There's no f bracing, there's no cross brace here. So you get the side to side unit movement. And without this in place, the whole thing can just collapse side to side. So what I'm gonna have to do is leave myself material Measuring it out, I only have five inches of clearance width. I've got 17 wide on the unit, and this is 22 inches wide inside. So I can leave myself about two inches of side material to the bottom, and I pretty much have to cut out the entire half height-wise. So, you know, it's gonna be cutting out a huge rectangle of the bottom and hope that that's still enough support for this thing not to collapse. Uh, if it's not, well, it's time to shop for a much better EV rack. Hopefully it is. Now, the only thing I'm gonna be putting on the top are the relatively light things. The heaviest part will be the battery backup. These are what I use for uh, basically power conditioning everywhere around the house. Now, they're specifically for their, their intended purpose because we have lightning like crazy around here. It's the lightning capital of the world for a reason. Every piece of electronics in the house, all my computers, TVs, everything goes through a battery in it. Very important. And everything in here goes through a battery in it. And it works great to condition the power for your audio. So, you know, nothing is actually directly connected to my grid. Works great. And it's, this is a 575 unit. It's got some heft to it. You know, it's a good 15, maybe 20 pounds max. So that'll be the heaviest thing on the shelf. It's way lighter than the old receiver, not worried about it. 
that stuff doesn't weigh a thing. That's, you know, the streaming boxes, ethernet switch, power strip, lots of little wall warts and power adapters and cables. That's it, that's all that goes up on the shelf now. I'm still gonna keep the cooling fan up on top. The hot air will still rise and that'll still work as intended. So right now I'm gonna get to measuring, cut out that hole and we'll cross our fingers that my cabinet survives. And there we go. I think that's going to work very nicely. Now, because I had already cut out the very corner there, that was the original port for all the speaker wires and power cords to come in, I was missing some vertical support. So I just added one little screw just for it to rest on, and that firmed everything right up. Solid as it was before, and I should have about a half inch of clearance all the way around, and it's going to probably stick out about that far. Let's see if it fits. This thing is a beast. All right, got it as far forward as I can. Perfect fit. Plenty of room here. It's still completely on the feet underneath, so they're not hanging off. Obviously plenty of room to wire. It's actually a lot easier. Cool, okay, now to wire it up. So I'm gonna wrap this up tomorrow. I just ordered some good banana plugs. I had some from Amazon before and they were giant hunks of crap, even though they got great reviews, terrible connections. So I went with a good brand this time. I'm gonna go ahead and do the extra two Atmos speaker installs. And I'm not gonna do the back two quite as wide as what these will now be called the front. I'm gonna bring them in partially because I'm just slightly over that lip there that wall kick out and uh because i'm my theory is because i can't go as back as i really need to ideally they would be about three feet behind the wall my theory is if i bring them in just a little bit from the front it might help kind of localize them more as a rear overhead sound I don't know. There's no information from Dolby about alternative placements or what works better, what's worse. I mean, nothing. They just give you a chart with some ideal measurements and here you go, have fun. <laughs> so I see all kinds of installs. They got speakers that you can put on the wall here and they shoot down. Speakers that are shooting down from the back corner. You got the speakers that are up on the front shooting down. And of course you've got the enabled speakers which bounce up and bounce down. You've got in ceiling with all kinds of specs of where they should be. I mean, I think you're just winging it. And then you've got on top of that DTS-X, which has no specifications. They just say, eh, use whatever speakers you want. Doesn't matter. <laughs> so I really don't think it matters all that much. But I'm gonna do the best I can. What I think I'm gonna do, given my stud placements, it's gonna work out if I center them right about at the edge of my acoustic panels. So one right about here and focus, and one right about there. You can kind of see the outline on camera of one of the stud edges there. It just happens to match up. There's another stud right about here and I got just enough clearance to fit the speaker cutout. And these are again, eight inch mica sound great these are awesome speakers uh what were they 40 bucks each 45 bucks each something like that great atmos speakers they've got a tiltable tweeter so i've got them pointed at the seating position no complaints so i'll put two more up there now the only thing i have to double check i'm confident where the studs are and i won't go through the install i already did a video on that but my uh detector is detecting a electrical conduit and I've got an outlet right here and I know the line does run straight up the wall and it does come this way. Now I don't know if it is directly on top of the drywall, which is possible because I did just nearly miss a line when I put in that speaker that's running directly on the drywall and it very, very well may be from that outlet there. So they may have run the electrical lines like that. However, it may be just above the insulation stapled to the rafters. So I will check that out and I'll poke a dowel up through. That's for both locating it in, when I'm in the attic and for taping the wires to to pull back through. And while I'm up there, I'm gonna dig to the bottom 
and feel for whatever line is there and move it out of the way however necessary first. So the next part is the sucky part, crawling around the attic in Florida midday sun. So I've got my location sticks up there in the middle of the template, got them lined up and they're between studs enough. What I need to do is run new wire, two new wires again, same as I did for the other two Atmos speakers from my main drop down there, up and over. So that's the easy part. Uh, unfortunately, I've got rafters coming down in a V right about here and the big AC flex duct, and it is a maze to get back to this side. It, it, it I can't explain it. It's just really terrible. You, you can't really crawl under, you can't step over. You have to be a monkey and it's like 115, 120 up there, 100% humidity, <laughs> it's bad. But I need to check and make sure that I don't have a electrical line on top of the drywall right here. If there is, I will just tack it up out of the way, and that way I can cut my hole safely. Uh, shouldn't have any problem with this one, because this electrical line runs over, and I know that it runs just on the side of that speaker. So uh, once I get back here, it's easy enough, because I got walkway from the back to the front on this side and on this side, but it's this middle part that is darn near impossible to get through and then over here i got planks down above the fireplace where i can kneel and get to my drop here where there are holes drilled through the headers to drop the wires and all the wife helped me i'll take that again out from the wall so i've got a nice big space and she can just grab the two new wires coming down and that's it and i had to freaking buy a new drywall saw because i have no idea what happened to mine the last time i saw it is when i cut the two holes for the original two speakers and it just disappeared. Who knows? Mission accomplished. In the attic, I think that's my sixth or seventh trip up there. Not fun. Used to it, but not fun. Key is, don't stir up the shit. I've got foot placements where it's tamped down on top of the rafters so I know where to step for the most part. But watch when you're grabbing stuff because that stuff's floating everywhere. And when you grab stuff for handholds, sorry, got interrupted by a phone call. As I was saying, the key is don't disturb stuff because reaching up is when all it gets into the air. I didn't use a mask this time because I could not breathe. It was that hot last time. And I literally couldn't breathe. It was just soaked with sweat and I was being choked out. So I was just very careful. I don't feel like I breathed anything in like I did the first time I was up here. That was bad. That was, that was a big mistake. I was knocking stuff all over the place, you know, trying to figure out how to walk through the maze. And man, I came down coughing. I was coughing blood for a couple days. Fiberglass, the blown in stuff is no joke. So be careful. If you're not gonna use a mask, don't stir up the shit. But I got them. I got the speaker wires tied to my poles, so they're up there good. I looked around and there wasn't any electrical cord going over the drywall at that point. It was actually going, uh, not parallel, the other one, 90 degree, perpendicular. And it was on top of the rafters, so no worries there, plenty of clearance. I cleared out the insulation around where I'm gonna cut so I won't have the mountain coming through when they drop like I did the first time. And uh, the wires are down, should be, in the master drop now so i'm waiting for the banana plugs to come before i wire everything in but for now it's just go in cut the holes mount the speakers and wait uh, my parents just called that was a phone call and they're going to come over they haven't seen the new pavers or anything yet so and i think dad and i are going to lowe's after that too he wants uh, a new garbage can he's probably going to pick out some at least one of the new fans Amazon dropped off my new banana plugs, got everything wired in. Man, I'll tell you what, having this cutout in the back really makes things convenient. Now I can just plug in my sources, loop power and input wires through that hole there. Still have plenty of ventilation. Plugging in an HDMI is no big deal, just reaching back here so I can tune with REW. Love it. 
So for those interested, these are the banana, 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 banana plugs that I went with this time. Now this is the third set I've tried. I tried a set from Walmart, absolute crap. I mean, just a total janky connection. I went with a set from Amazon. They're actually Amazon branded, I believe, and they're a copy of the Sewells. Oh my God, they're total crap. Those not only were loose, but they spun, they rotated. The Sewells don't do that, they're a solid design. And I got the Amazon ones because they had like, I don't know, 3,000 five-star reviews. Well, all I can say is most of those people were either fake reviews or they just have no clue about banana plugs. And of course you go on audio file forums and they say, yeah, they're absolute crap. We have no idea why people are buying them. Well, I bought them because I trusted the review system. So these are the third set I tried. Excellent, absolutely love them. Now they have two different versions. When you look it up, you'll see a open and closed screw design. The open screw design has what I'll show you in a second, the set screws exposed. This is the closed design and it has a sleeve. So it looks a little bit better. Um, same basic function. So it's just what you wanna go with. So it's a two piece system. Here you have the connector itself. Very sturdy, all one piece, nothing moving, no flex, no nothing. And you have two set screws, top and bottom. So you put your bare wire in here, cinch down your set screws so the wire's captured there on two places. And then this sleeve, there's a black and a red colored one, screws down onto this connector. And there you go. And it extends slightly past your bare wire coming out. You should have the sheath for the wire, you know, just into that inner piece, and it's solid. There's no movement whatsoever. Now this is a very tight fit the first time you put it in. <laughs> There's a joke there. But after these flex just once, much easier. Still extremely solid, but much easier to take in and out. But the first time, don't be shocked if you have to really kind of dunk and it'll eventually go in. These just have to break in once. Really love them. I got a 12 pair set and I believe it was like, I wanna say 24 bucks, whatever it was. Good deal, definitely recommend them. I'll put the link down below if you need some and they do come in uh, smaller packages as well. Got the new rear Atmos speakers in. Everything went to plan, no problemo. So, before I change anything, I'm probably gonna at least retune, if not maybe move things around just a slightly tweak, because I've changed half the furniture in here since the last time I tuned with REW, I'm gonna put everything exactly back the way it was and give it a listen, go through my library so I can compare, at least in my mind, the old receiver versus the new, that being the only thing changed. I'm Gonna do the exact same setup. You know, I do a flat EQ. I'm just doing the basic room correction for phase levels and distance. So I'm not gonna change anything there. I'm gonna set the sub and the gains and everything to the exact same settings that they were. And that way I can do, at least in my mind, an A-B test to see what the differences is that I'm hearing from the two. Again, I'm looking for hopefully a better sound stage maybe some more depth, maybe a little bit wider, maybe some height, I don't know. The other thing is I'm hoping for a better overall Atmos experience. Now, because I now have front and rear in the system, now these aren't truly rear, they're directly overhead, but in the system they're called rear Atmos. I'm just hoping I hear more overall. I know they work because it was funny, I, I had my dad over and we were watching a movie, can't remember what it was. It might've been the, the butterfly documentary. Anyway, at the end of it, I didn't tell him these were up here. I didn't, he's not techie at all. Does not know anything at all about home theater. He just wanted to see the movie, right? So it's an Atmos movie and it actually has uh, a decent amount of effects in it. But after the movie, he looks at me, we're both sitting here and he's like, you know, is it just my imagination or is a lot of the sound coming from over my head. And again, he had no idea these were here. He didn't even see them. They blend. You see them on camera, but trust me, to the naked eye, they blend in really well 
um, to the ceiling, especially when I have that closed and the side light isn't hitting them like this. They're, it's all white. They do blend in very well. So anyway, I said, yeah, and I, I pointed up and he, he still didn't know what I was doing. I, I just had these two in and I pointed up and he's like, what are you pointing at? I said, yeah, there's the speakers up there. He's like, oh, that explains it. So it works. I mean, people can tell the sounds coming up there. But my problem is because I'm constantly testing and tuning and I want to hear the differences, yada, yada, I'm critically listening to absolutely everything. I hear the flaws in every change I make. And I, I really have a hard time sometimes even noticing the effect unless it's something obvious like, you know, an, an object specifically going over your head. But the more general atmospheric sounds, it's hard for me to say, yes, okay, I can hear that. And that's definitely coming from the Atmos speakers, yada, yada, yada. So what I'm hoping is just having the extra two, doubling the amount of speakers up there helps with the overall effect. If it does that, I'm happy. If I hear something different, as far as how the effects are used, well, that's just a bonus. But we'll see. I have no idea what movies even use a front and a back. I don't know how movies are mixed. It, it's so poor these days. They might just throw everything up into a height channel, and however many speakers you have, that's what it plays. I don't know if they're going to play evenly. I don't know if things are going to be panning front to back. No clue. But I just want to notice it more. I want it to be a little more distinctive. Because, you know, right now, knock on wood, these were a really good deal. But for those people spending five, six, seven hundred bucks a pair for Atmos speakers, I'd be really, really pissed off at the lack of use for that kind of money. Eighty bucks a pair? Eh. Don't really care. It's a nice thing. But I'd be pissed if I was spending hundreds or over a thousand dollars and only getting the tiny bit of material that's out there. Okay, got a lot to go through here. So it's actually been a couple days since the last clip. Uh, haven't had a lot of time with the new puppy to really get in on this, but since the wife's been home today, I've been finishing up my testing, tuning, and evaluation. Now, to be clear, the only thing I've done is simply unplug the old receiver, plug in the new one, all the same basic settings. I'm not using any EQ, I'm not doing any DSP program, nothing. Just the basic YPAO distance and level and phase and time delay and all that kind of stuff. Um, I may end up using some stuff in the future. Probably not. I didn't with the old receiver. But there is one new feature for this 2019 receiver called Surround AI. And I'll get to a funny story about that in a second. But... The other thing I added were the additional two Atmos speakers. And those may be playing a huge part in some of what I'm hearing. It may be the receiver. Unfortunately, doing both at the same time, I can't tell you exactly how much of either is contributing. But here are the results. So first of all, in two-channel stereo, which I listen to a lot, this is my one good seating position in the room. And I have everything set up for this particular seat. Wife never listens to music at all on the system. So this seat beside me, completely irrelevant. I'm sitting in the sweet spot. And it kept the pinpoint precision of the stereo image that the old receiver had. However, it did add quite a bit to the entire package. It's nothing mind-blowing. Now, I went into this not really knowing what to expect, but I had some hopes and wishes. Didn't all come true. This isn't a mind-blowing upgrade, but it is full of lots of little things. First of all, the soundstage does not have any more or any really definitive height information. I think that's much more a function of your speakers than your amplifier or processor. So no change there, that's okay. Can't really detect any change in the depth either. 
Everything pretty much sounds like it's just slightly pushed back behind the speakers, but I have a weird room. I've got the fireplace right in the middle and the speakers are kind of in between the planes. That, that just happens to be where they can be in the room and where I get a great locked in image. So everything sounds like it's playing or people are singing from inside the fireplace if it's you know a really centered image. Totally fine with that, sounds great. But I'm not hearing anything where I hear the front singer say a few feet forward or the drums pushed back like you can in true audiophile setups. So that didn't change. But what did change was the not only overall width, it got wider. Now I had a few tracks where I would listen on the old system and it was very clear and definitive for a few feet beyond the speakers. The speakers pretty much disappear in this setup no matter what, which is good. So all I'm, all I'm listening to is the actual sound stage. And it used to go a few feet on some tracks wider than the speakers. In this new receiver, it is even wider, but even more impressive is how things are spread out. Before, most things were locked into the center. I mean, the singers' voices sounded like they were people-sized, you know, the size of a head. It didn't sound like it was three or four feet wide. It was very spot on. And you had a little bit of spread of instruments. If it's a good live recording, for example, or a concert, you, you could tell that, okay, that guy was slightly stage left or slightly stage right. Now, that type of information is using the entire soundstage width. It is a little mind-blowing what a difference that makes to just enjoying the music. So I'm going through dozens of tracks. I mean, stuff that I've heard over and over and over that I love listening to and stuff I use for testing. So, I mean, I'm playing tracks. It's just like I'm looking. I'm physically looking at where these instruments are coming from now. It's still not coming from the speakers. It's coming from the entire soundstage. And the speaker position has not changed. Nothing in the room has changed. That is a definitive difference. The other thing that's slight but noticeable, again, not mind-blowing, not like, oh my God, huge difference, but you definitely hear it if you're doing some kind of A-B test. And these are things that I wasn't looking for, I wasn't expecting, I, I had low expectations. But everything is, for lack of a better term, more musical, clearer. You didn't, at least I didn't notice on the old system, but it's something that now that I can hear something different, I can tell that there was a difference, if that makes any sense. It's not like the old one sounded bad by any stretch of the imagination. It's just this one sounds a little smoother, a little more real, especially live concert sound. It just sounds more like you're there in person. And it's subtle. I mean, I, I, I'm not a professional audio reviewer, so I can't give you many more terms than that. But it just sounds more overall real. I'm looking at the screen because something keeps flashing. It's, this NVIDIA Shield is driving me absolutely insane again. During all of this, it of course... Oh, it's giving me Google tips and tricks. It's of course giving me fits and updates and restarts and making me pull my hair out. Anyway, so... Two-channel music, very nice, worthwhile upgrade. Um, if you're paying full retail, I don't know. This thing's, I think it was $14.99 retail. I got it for $800 on a flash sale. So good deal at $800 for sure. I don't regret it. I would probably regret it if I was just interested in music and I paid $1,400, $1,500. So bear that in mind. It's not that big of a difference, but noticeable. So the other change is movies. That same difference of it just sounds smoother somehow, somehow more real, completely translates into not only movies in general, but especially dialogue and any kind of music in movies. I burned through so many of the DTSX and Dolby Atmos demos because obviously it's a great uh, height effects channel demo, but a lot of them have 
really good music tracks too. And especially things like drums. The bass especially. I don't know what's different. The only thing different that I saw was the old one had a three-band parametric EQ for the sub-channel. They've added one more band. And the YPAO system does take advantage of that. So there's a little bit more EQ to the sub-channel. Still not up on par with other brands like Denon and Marantz. They still give you more. But four is better than three. And I just let it, just like the old system, let it completely tune itself. I haven't modified anything other than setting speakers to small and set my crossovers at uh, the appropriate 80 hertz and, you know, normal basic setup. So the parametric EQ is set up automatically, same as the other system. But the bass is tighter. The transients are noticeably tighter. There were especially some two-channel music tracks. Um, Daft Punk's, I believe it was End of Line, it has some really low, in the teens and low 20s, background bass tracks. And on the old system, it was more of a set of tones. And in this one, it's a definitive set of notes. The transients got cleaned up. And even though that's a subtle change, it's a big impact to the overall sound. But the whole spectrum cleaned up in the same way. It is very noticeable in movies as well as music. Now getting to the biggest change, in my opinion, and again, I don't know if this is because I added two more, or the receiver, or a combination of the both, but holy crap, Atmos just got 10 times better than it was before. Now, you, if you watch my other videos, you know I've said a million times, don't spend a lot of money on the Atmos because it's not that impressive. And it wasn't. Whether it's just because I just had two up there or it was just the old processor, I, I think it has more to do with just having two up there and the system only being able to take advantage of two height channels. I think the combination of adding two more not only gave me more overall volume, for the height channels, more sound pressure for the overall height effect, but having them in different positions. It is now what I had in my head before I started any of the project. It now is a true bubble of convincing sound. The height effects are now absolutely as smooth and discreet as the surrounds or the fronts. It's day and night. The old one, there was a lot of localization. You know, I could hear when there was a height effect, something going on, like a voice or a helicopter or something like that, but I could point. I could point to exactly where the speaker is every single time. And if it was an ambient sound like rain or butterflies or uh, leaves in a forest or something like that, you could still tell that there were two speakers making all that sound. Well, that is gone. I cannot localize any of the height effect sounds at all anymore. Things are definitely moving front to back. It's, again, subtle. It's not like I can, you know, look behind me and say, oh, there's something, you know, coming from the other room back there. No, I can tell it's something slightly behind me and there's something slightly ahead of me. But you can't tell that it's coming from that speaker or that speaker or that speaker or that speaker. It's just this smooth transient of sound that is really cool so my recommendation is again if you're only doing two atmos don't throw a lot of money into it it's not going to pay itself back if you're going to do atmos my recommendation is only at a minimum do four speakers i i truly think that has m more to do with it than anything else I couldn't do four with the old receiver, so I don't know A-B test how much the receiver is playing into this. But like I said, I think it's just the fact that I went from two to four height channels. So huge difference there. More than enough worth it for movies. I burned through um, a lot of the DTS-X demos play scenes from movies in which they've used it. And that is really the biggest difference. The Dolby Atmos demos are more 
tech demos. They're not scenes from movies with a couple exceptions, but they're showing off what the technology can do. Unfortunately, 99% of the movies don't do any of it. So while it's cool and it's nice to show your friends and demo your system, it doesn't really do you any good in movies. But the DTX, DTSX demos, those are showing you, hey, this is what's actually in production. So that's really cool to go through all the different scenes of movies that they put in there on the demo discs. And it is very worthwhile and noticeable now with 4. So there you go. There are my thoughts on the differences between the mid-grade and upper-grade Yamaha receivers. Uh, if you are looking for a serious upgrade, I would say it's going to depend on, number one, your room, if you can do four speakers or not, and number two, if you can get a deal on the receiver. Anyway, that's it. See you next time.